We'll be getting started in just a moment. And I have put the chant in the chat in case you wanted to take a look at it. Um, this is a traditional Buddhist chant that we were doing <clears throat> earlier this fall when I started this series of talks on impermanence. And it's often used these days at like a funeral for somebody who's identified as a Buddhist might use this uh, traditional chant, but it's really a chant of liberation. And I'll talk about that after our sit. It's also a good time just to take a look around, see all the folks here this morning. It's our active work at not falling you know, because of habit, falling into the grip of loneliness, especially those of you who live alone at this time, because um, it's can be it's a compelling argument that we're alone <laughs> these days during COVID. So sort of alone, and but there's also this reality of being connected. It just may take a little bit more imagination and actual work where we're looking even though we're looking at a computer screen, we're sort of looking through that and we're realizing there's another human being with a life, with a body, with a conditioned heart, who's seeking to be happy, who is afflicted with the ordinary things we humans are afflicted with. And I can't help myself, I care about you, right? That's a natural, that compassionate, friendly response isn't something you or I have to do, we just have to take the time to realize this connection that's here. So I'm just gonna paste this again, in case those who came in recently didn't see the, this. And then for anybody who'd like to join in, let's do this chant now, the Anicca chant. And so this one actually is us chanting in Pali these four verses. And you see below, somebody gave out the pronunciation for each of the four lines. We'll do these four lines three times, and then we'll read the English. And as you can tell, I've muted all of you, so you're only gonna hear me, because it doesn't really work, of course, for us to chant together on Zoom. But it's nice it, whether you do it silently in your mind and your heart, or you do it out loud in your room, it's really nice to put your heart into it no matter what. And just let the words land. Don't try to figure them out. Just let them land. Anicca vata sankara upada vaya damino upajitu va nirushanti te sang upasamo sukho anicca vata sankara upada vaya damino Upajitu va nirushanti te sang upasamo sukho anicca vata sankara uparava yadamino upajitu va nirushanti te sang upasamo sukho now the English, all conditioned things arise and pass away. Understanding this deeply leads to the greatest happiness, which is peace. So taking any time you need to settle into a comfortable meditation posture. If you haven't yet, greeting the body, making peace with the body.
and discovering without forcing it, <clears throat> without imitating anything, just discovering this possibility of being friendly, kind, open hearted in the way we're relating, the way the mind heart is relating to the body now in a friendly way, kind hearted way. So is that possible? And then if it is possible, what does that look and feel like as you're just showing up for the body, the sitting body, the breathing body, the listening body in a friendly, kind hearted way? What is the experience of relating to the body in a generous, kind-hearted way. And are there any ideas or any habits that seem to get in the way of relating to the body in a kind way? And if not, then can we sustain this friendly way of being with the body? Even if it's not perfectly pleasant, even if the body isn't perfectly settled, can we relate to whatever discomfort there might be or whatever restlessness and settledness there might be? Can we relate in a friendly way? And with that ordinary rhythm of breathing in and breathing out, just feeling the physicality of breathing in and breathing out and let that easy movement of breath circulate this simple friendliness or kindness throughout the body. So use your imagination a little bit. It's like we're breathing in the kindness and we're giving it away as we exhale and in this way, just circulating so that the love, the kindness feels quite, it's not an idea, a static idea that I care about my body. It's sort of more a <clears throat> energetic warmth or a tenderizing this relationship of the mind and body, the heart and the body. As if the mind is actually affectionately connecting with the body. There's a visceral aspect to the way the heart is relating to the body right now. Just as if we were snuggling up a trusted snuggling up with a trusted friend or a dear pet. That kind of very familiar, kind-hearted connection, body and mind, heart and body. So it has a real flavor of integration belonging and the healing of that. We want to sense that this is always available. This attitude, this way of being of kindness, just beginning with the body and even more specifically relating to our own heart, the tender, sensitive heart, appreciating the heart, appreciating the exposure of the heart, exposed to whatever's coming and going. 
and the resilience of the heart, the sensitive heart that feels, that knows joy and sorrow. We care about this heart. Care enough to be close right now, right here. I care enough to feel, to keep in mind that the heart is like this now. It feels like this now. This heart, this body, this moment is like this now. And I care enough to be close in a loving way. And I'm not in a hurry to go anywhere else. I'm in a hurry to make anything happen. So we're realizing the love of the love that knows how to show up and be present and feel whatever's here moving. Not afraid to be present with the body, with the qualities here in the heart and mind, and really with the whole world. Learning how to abide to really trust this heart, this way of being that isn't looking for anything. It's instead relating in a generous way, this generous and affectionate presence with this life, a sensitive heart, this body, and this troubled world, all the beauty and goodness in the world, and all the very real suffering and fear and uncertainty in the world. We're realizing the heart that knows how to show up to this all. And that showing up is quite beautiful. It's itself is healing to show up to realize that the heart can show up in this place of generosity. I care enough to be present, to wish well. May all beings, all things be at ease. Being love, being compassion is quite stable and resonant, abiding. Feel that boundless, that generous, expansive quality if you can. And really trust in a way, allowing the heart to be as wide and deep as the whole world. Nothing is left out. Nothing needs to be hidden away. Love knows how to hold it all, how to hold everything in kindness and compassion, appreciation, and this really beautiful balance of equanimity, knowing that this is how it is now. 
these joys, these sorrows, here specifically in the body, out there, everywhere in the world, no exceptions. So we'll continue in silence now for a while.
And just do your best to start over. Have confidence that the mind can find its way back to relating with love, relating to the body, relating to the heart, relating to this moment, this world with love. And then abiding in that expansive, beautiful quality that way of relating. And realize you can go from doing the love, being the one who loves, to a more relaxed, resting in love. And keeping in mind that generous, expansive quality, boundless quality. And feel the balance. This is the heart, the mind that can show up in our world. can experience greed, hatred, and delusion in our own heart and in others without being confused, without feeling so pushed around by the meanness in the world and in our own hearts.
And remember if something appears to be in the way and just see if you can skillfully have a friendly, tender-hearted way of being with whatever seems to be in the way. Some difficult thought or memory, some painful sensation. So in a way it gets included in the radiance of friendliness, good-heartedness. May this love continue and increase and never end. And now for the last three or four minutes, just continue abiding here in the friendly, tender-hearted heart. But notice that this awareness that's here, this kindness, generous kindness that's here, Realize that there's nobody really doing the awareness or doing the kindness. It's a kind of extra that upon an examination doesn't really hold up. There is awareness. There is this generous, kind attitude, inclusive attitude of love. We don't need to construct some idea that I'm doing it or that the love, the awareness refers back to me. Just pick up this exploration for these last few minutes, how natural and in a sense impersonal this loving awareness is. It's here, it's happening. And that's really all we need to say. And just learning to trust and abide in this kind, generous awareness that knows how to include.
And just take a moment, adjust your body as you need to. Again, it's really nice to be with everybody this morning. <clears throat> so you might notice the room's a little different for me. I'm out at Common Grounds Retreat property in near Prairie Farm, Wisconsin, about 83 miles east of Minneapolis and St. Paul. And we've just recently completed a pretty major renovation. And I'm sliding into a little retreat time. So I'll be continue continue to teach and work this week. And then starting the 1st of December, I'll be on retreat for about 19 days. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, we're finishing up a series of talks and discussions around the Buddhist teachings on impermanence. And uh, just understanding, remember the, the really important thing the Buddha had to do in trying to convey his experience, his own awakening experience, and using language to articulate it so that it would be useful, his own awakening process could be useful for others. He had to describe how our, what seems to me at least, I'm guessing it's true for all of us, this very personal experience I have of suffering, the Buddha had to map it out as a natural process. And then he also had to map out the awakening, this movement towards freedom, toward the release of the heart, not in terms of something that I do. I'm a deluded human being with a lot of habits around greed, hatred, and delusion, and I need to practice in order to become free right? That's a very common view. Probably we all have that to some degree and certainly very dominant point of view when we're beginning our meditation practice, this idea. Yeah, I have a conditioned mind. I'm not so proud of my habits. A lot of them are not so skillful and they're weightful. They hurt and they cause harm around me. And I really want to practice to uproot these habits, right? This all sounds very like something you could hear me or somebody say, or you've said it yourself, right? I'm practicing in order to be awakened. And so it's understandable, but we don't wanna get stuck with that initial formulation in our mind because it ends up being a problem. When we have that view, that I'm here and I need to get over there, then being here has all of a sudden become a problem. And we're threatened by being here because <laughs> it's not where we think we should be. And this is just a, one more version of that cult of perfection. Who I am, what I am, not perfect. Where I imagine I'm going or where I imagine I should go, that's perfect. And I need to get the heck out of here and get over there. And then even when we happen to get over there and we have a really nice state of mind, like maybe even in the sit today, you had moments where there was some of that generous, expansive quality or attitude of the mind and it felt really nice and somewhat healing. Even then, whether we notice it or not, the mind is haunted by our ordinary states. Like, oh, I don't want to go back to that anger I have when I read the news or when I go to work or when this happens or that happens, right? So this is the thing like even as powerful in healing as deep meditative states can be, like really profound states of quiet and peacefulness, we have to come back and do the laundry and relate to our partners and our kids, some of you and our bodies and our world and the injustice in our world, the messiness in our world's communities. So it's like a vacation. You know, we, we want to take the seclusion that is available to us. So a good sit, a nice massage, a decent hug from a friend, 
you know, a warm bath, nice bowl of soup, a nice walk in a place that's pleasant along, you know, a meadow in the woods, along a lake when the sun is shining or whatever that for us helps our heart feel secluded from what torments us. You know, the stimuli, the experiences that trigger my condition habits for greed, for fear, for aversion, for closing down and going into denial, right? So there are ways that we can, um, not always, because we're not in complete control, but there are some <clears throat> ways we can navigate life so that we have these experiences of being secluded. This is a specific early Buddhism way of talking about it, where we're secluding our sensitive heart from what triggers habits that torment us, right? So if there's somebody that, I don't know if some of you might have read Carlos Castaneda's books way back when, but he had this idea in his books from his teacher, Don Juan, of petty tyrants, right? These things are usually people in our lives that are our petty tyrant, that disturb our mind. And, you know, in those, when we're, we don't have a lot of wisdom, we just presume that this person is such a bad actor, such a bad person, that my disturbance is caused by them being the way that they are. So we sort of blame them for the disturbance in our own mind. And we don't realize it when we do that, when we blame the world or another person for this disturbance, we don't realize how that uh, brings in a sense of helplessness. Because basically what we've just said to ourselves is whenever I'm around or exposed to a person like that or a world like this, then my heart has to be disturbed like this. So I can't actually be in this world where these people are or these situations are. I have to transcend it. I have to get myself to a kind of heaven where these disturbing people and these disturbing situations aren't here. And then I'll be happy, you know? And basically a pretty large part of our economy is all about getting us the hell away from what disturbs us. You know, one more modern convenience, one more of this, you know, Netflix. Yeah, but what happens if it's on Amazon Prime or HBO or HBO Prime or whatever the super HBO is <laughs> where you get special stuff? <laughs> and then on and on. It, it's like there's always one more thing until we have access to everything that will make us feel perfect, perfectly safe, perfectly content, perfectly fed. So this is our ordinary pursuit. We're looking for the happiness of having what we want and not having what we don't want. That's almost the whole show, right? And then if we're fortunate, we wake up a little and we realize how stressful that is. Even if, even if you're one of those more fortunate people, have privilege, good fortune, good circumstances where you get, you have some mobility, you have some capacity to navigate your life and get away from what's unpleasant and toward what's pleasant, even then you can detect how stressful it is to need to maintain these good conditions, these good circumstances, and how you're not out of the woods because things change. And we're not, and we know if we if we're at all reflective that we can't control everything. So whatever good we found can be taken away. And we're vulnerable to that. And that is an insight. That's not a problem. Initially, we may the mind superficial mind might interpret it as a problem. But we actually want to get to that place. So in the past weeks, I've talked about the cooling of dispassion, the cooling that arises with the deepening of wisdom, where even if we're pretty fortunate, somehow 
we're losing our interest. There's a pretty graphic example in the suttas of uh, a very efficient butcher who's able with a sharp knife, her sharp knife, to remove all the flesh on the bones and then throws the bones to the dog. And the dog, you know, there's just a little smeared blood on the bones and that's about it. The blood, you know, sensing food, gnaws and gnaws and gnaws, only cutting the gums, chewing on the bones, and then getting confused by his own saliva mixed with the blood from his own torn up gums, thinking there's food there, but there's no food. And that's the image. I know it's a very disturbing, provocative image. That's the image the Buddha uses that's used in the early Buddhist tradition to describe the basic um, situation where we're pursuing comforts, but never finding full lasting satisfaction. And, And on some level, wisdom haunts us. Thank God. But it's not pleasant that it haunts us, but it's the only way out. And in the tradition, in the early Buddhist tradition, we talk about that as the insight into the drawbacks of sensuality. And people misunderstand that, that the Buddha is saying that sensuality is bad. No, central experience, having sense experience is just what it is. Like I'm in a room, it's really beautiful, but this room doesn't get very good heat. And so my feet are really cold, but it's really pleasant, right? So it's sort of like, it's not perfect. And when I was in the city, I could think, oh, getting out of the city, that's the ticket. But it's not. It's nice. In some ways, I prefer being here. But it hasn't taken care of my uneasy heart. Right? And strangely, you know, I want to go back to the city. (laughs) I want to check the news. I want to do this. I want to do that. Right? eat the food I want to eat, eat when I want to eat, which you can't when you're on a retreat schedule with a few other people, you know, you have to conform. And this is the thing, nothing in sense experience saves us. And boy, have we tried, you know, we've really tried to find a person, a lover, to find a place to live, to find food, to find a sexual experience, to find some vacation, some travel, to find even ideas like reading and knowledge that will quench that uneasiness in our hearts. Okay, raise your hand if you found that total and complete satisfaction. (laughs) So we have 195 people here. I'm going to check participants, see if anybody's raised their hand (laughs) and we'll put you on the spot. Where did you find it? (laughs) Could you draw us a map so we can get there? But, But that in, even though this wisdom is developing that sense experience isn't delivering, we don't give up on the project of sense experience. We just let our relationship to sense experience mature. So when I can have a nice bowl of soup and it's not causing anybody a lot of harm for me to eat that nice bowl of soup, I'm gonna eat it. And if I can put socks on so my feet aren't so cold, I'll do that. So I'm still gonna play in this world of sensuality, but I'm gonna, because this wisdom is deepening, the wisdom of dispassion, I'm not expecting even as I get the soup, even as I turn up the heat or put the socks on, even as I take a trip out to the country or go on retreat or take a bath or whatever you or I do to get some basic sense comfort, more and more I'm not confused by the comfort. It's nice. There is a real gratification to having this experience and I can't count on it. That's the drawback. It isn't, it all it is, is in a, at best, it's buying a little time where I don't feel overwhelmed by discomfort, 
because that doesn't help. That's kind of the ascetic route. And you know how much it uh, aligns with the actual history, who knows, but <clears throat> because part of the story of the Buddha is a little mythological, but it was said that for the first, much of the first six years from the time he left his very comfortable worldly life to his deep insight, um, a lot of that time the Buddha practiced really extreme ascetic practices, which would be very uncomfortable, like not eating, you know, bearing cold conditions, being out in the jungle where creepy crawlers and mosquitoes would clearly torment you, right? Let alone the danger from the tigers and other animals at the time. So just living, and this is not just in India, but in a lot of cultures, Christian tradition as well, you know, there are these strands of uh, thinking that by enduring really painful conditions, it's liberating. So instead of, it's like flipping, okay, I'm pursuing sense pleasure. I realize it's a dead end. Okay, I'm going to expose myself to extreme displeasure and tolerate that as if that leads somewhere. And the Buddha rejected both, thinking that sense pleasures are gonna get you somewhere in the end, that's, that's a mythology. Thinking that somehow avoiding sense pleasures is gonna go anywhere, that's also a myth, right? So to whatever degree we have some sense pleasures available, take, what is actually useful, receive, what's actually useful to receive, use it to stabilize our mind and body. We think of, you know, in early Buddhism, we think of sense pleasures as medicine. It's actually a really nice attitude. So when you're fixing yourself a meal, you know, you, you listen into your body. Okay, hon, <clears throat> what can I fix you that will be good medicine for this life? And when you decide you're going to watch some entertainment, what kind of entertainment would actually be good medicine for my life, for my heart, my mind? The trace that would be left from watching that show would have a positive effect on my mind stream, my heart stream going forward, right? I mean, wouldn't we be, that would be sort of the, when I take sleep, you know, how can I sleep in a way that's really good for me? How can I have social relationships that plant seeds of healing, seeds of happiness in me and in the world? What would be good medicine? When we get involved in activism, try to make the world a better way, better place, how can I show up to suffering that plants seeds for deeper healing and liberation and justice? So the whole world is really medicine the world of experience. And what does that medicine do? It allows for the awakening process, which is a natural and impersonal process. And it doesn't come, the awakening process isn't about escaping to nice conditions. Instead, finding nice conditions and using those nice experiences as medicine to stabilize my heart and mind so I can see clearly be more intimate, that really brings us to the awakening process. And this is the happiness and freedom, not of having what I want and being away from what I don't want. That's kind of the frustrating ordinary level of happiness, frustrating in the sense that it doesn't, can't be dependent on. When we use our sense experience to stabilize the mind, the heart, so that we can see clearly, then we're using the, the awakening process is really realizing the freedom of the mind not dependent on sense experience. And this is hard to put into words, but it's absolutely here and now for everybody here to reflect on. So one phrase that I find helpful from Ajahn Chah, one of our important teachers of the last 
hundred years, a wonderful um, Thai meditation uh, teacher and Buddhist monk in the Thai forest tradition, a trainer of many of our uh, early Western teachers in this last 50 years or so. And uh, Ajahn Chah would call Nibbana or Nirvana, this awakening, this liberation, realizing the heart, realizing the mind free of grasping. So we know our mind, but mostly what, you know, over all these years of being a somebody, mostly what we take to be me or these different patterns of me grasping or getting pushed around by my my likes and dislikes, right? So that, <clears throat> excuse me, that activity of grasping, wanting this, not liking that, pursuing this, you know, even when we think about who I am, it's often in terms of what I like and I don't like, you know, in terms of our sexual orientation, for example, I'm, th I'm that identity, whatever that might be. I'm a straight uh, male or something like that, cisgendered male. So whatever that is, you know, then it's related to, to kind of a sense desire. It's okay. You know, I'm somebody who likes to live in the country. I'm somebody who likes to live in the city. I'm somebody who likes the policies of Democrats. I'm somebody who likes the policies of Republicans. I'm somebody who thinks the world should be this way. I'm not somebody who thinks the world should be that way. So, so much of the sense of self is the alignment, aligning the sense, the selfing sense with desiring, attachment to our desires, identification with desiring. That's, I mean, we don't think of it, which we might, it might actually be valuable to reflect on it, even on this cognitive level, you know, about the activity of self. So the freedom the Buddha realized was using, right, he took good food, he didn't try to avoid comfort, sense comforts, stabilized his mind because he felt good. And then he used that stability of mind to <clears throat> observe, to be mindful of what's happening, what's coming and going, observing, 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 and uh, not getting confused by his thoughts about what's happening. Those are just thoughts. And basically started to realize that the underlying nature, it's always been this way, but the mind's just, the attention's just been too superficial to notice. The underlying nature is a movement. It's a flow. There aren't any things here. <laughs> you know, there aren't any, there aren't actually any nouns. But language, the way we language, and then our identification with the meaning our language constructs, it creates a kind of staticness. So when I think of Mark, me, as a concept using language, me, Mark, the personal pronoun, me, I, me, mine, my name, Mark, my titles, whatever I might be identified with. There's a certain, the concept has a certain st a static quality to it. But you know, when we actually reflect, and you might want to do this with me right now, like just take one of your identities that I'm a mother, you know, might be for some of you an identity. I'm a father, I'm a partner, I'm a concerned citizen, I'm a male, I'm a female, I'm queer. So whatever you might comfortable identity that you use in your life. And don't, I'm not pathologizing identities. We need them. They just need to be used skillfully. And uh, when we use an identity, just see that identity. And in that moment of thinking, I'm a male. And then just watch how very quickly it dissolves. Like the meaning is there with the thought. The kind of substance of that meaning has a momentary sense of solidity 
and then it dissolves. So try that a few times. I'll be quiet. You can even try your age. I'm 62 years old. So it's like that constructed meaning, I'm sick, I'm healthy, I'm 70, I'm 25. There's that, that coherence that that thought and the meaning of that thought has, and then it dissolves. And if we are, if the awareness, present moment awareness is stable, no agenda, just wanting to see things as they are, you'll see that thoughts have this appearance of substance, the constructed meaning. And then if we just leave things alone, that constructed meaning, that constructed sense of substance dissolves. And then the moment, the next moments will be empty of that previously substantial meaning. Did you get that? This is something you can do all the time. In fact, this is not... Uh, this is like a nice simile for maybe, who knows, I'm not there, but maybe this is what an awakened mind heart is like. It's not that they're afraid of concepts, afraid of constructed meaning, afraid of being a kind of a human being on this ordinary level, but they're just not missing the dissolution of meaning, of constructed meaning. So they're understanding both the relative usefulness of constructed meaning, like our identities. I'm a male, I'm queer, I'm a white cisgendered male, you know, whatever. Like these identities have a time and place that can clarify, especially in our social dynamics, kind of what's going on. And then at the same time, the mind is aware of the dissolution that the meaning is a momentary relative happening. And then it dissolves. And so this is really good, like in moments of humiliation and embarrassment, moments of being really triggered by something you're reading in the news or triggered by some interaction you had with another person. Like, to be a good practitioner doesn't mean, oh, no, no, I shouldn't be attached because I'm a Buddhist. I shouldn't react because I don't know much about my practice, but I know I'm not supposed to be reactive. And I know I'm not supposed to be attached. So instead, with, with more and more wisdom, we're not afraid of emotional reactivity. We're not afraid of being triggered we're giving up that project of being perfect, you know, a perfect person who doesn't get triggered, who doesn't have emotions, who doesn't, you know, have opinions. We're letting the opinions, the emotions, the reactions arise, and we're just seeing them for what they are. It's this thing that has this very coherent appearance, and it's also empty in the sense that it's not going to last. This is a great thing. You know, when you're on retreat, some of you know this, or when you are fortunate and you're able to live a life where you don't, you're not always being overwhelmed by your responsibilities and <clears throat> by external, difficult external conditions, like being sick or being impoverished or being taken advantage of, being oppressed in some way. So when you have relatively good circumstances, whether you're on retreat, but your mind, the stability of present moment awareness and the continuity of present moment awareness can really build some momentum. And that feels good. And the pleasantness of that continuity, you know, not perfect continuity, but the relative continuity of present moment awareness, it really, that's the pleasantness of that inner pleasantness of that, um, it has its own positive feedback. So then the idea is that we move through our life and we're 
in a way the heart's even more sensitive. The one image I like, uh, some of you I'm sure have seen a really taut drum skin, you know, like a bongo or whatever, um, or even some instruments like a stringed instrument with a really taut string. And then if you make some noise around that drum skin or that really tight um, stringed instrument, then that, that the drum skin or the string, it's gonna sympathetically vibrate what's going on around it, even though I may not touch it because this, the air itself is alive with the vibrations of the sound that's going on in the room, right? So this is a nice image for our sensitive heart. And then it gets amplified when we're cultivating the stability of present moment awareness. So when you do get more and more continuity of awareness, it is literally unbearable to remain an ignorant human being where we're taking our activation, our reactivity personally. It's just unbearable. So you see, it's not an easy path. So first, what we have to do is we, as best we can, working in the realm of sense experience, we try to have enough pleasant sense experience so we're not completely overwhelmed and we can settle down. And then on top of the settling that we get by having shelter and decent enough food and decent enough friendships and not being taken advantage of by people with power and all those sort of basic survival needs. Then on top of that, we settle with our meditative skills that we develop, like learning how to be present, learning how not to be swept away by strong emotions, right? And we really develop this momentum of present moment awareness, continue present moment awareness. And what we find is that we feel good. And exactly at the same time, we become really sensitive to everything. We feel everything in an amplified way. And so it's sort of a setup. The samadhi, we call that balance and continuity of present moment awareness, samadhi that unification of the mind. The mind is unified in being present in a continuous way. Whether you're using a particular meditation object to do that or just general knowing of whatever's predominant one moment at a time. So it doesn't always have to involve a meditation object developing that continuity of present moment awareness. And there's two flavors you can recognize. One is that inner unification, that integration of the heart and mind and body feels good. There's a good inner feeling, like a emotional quality of wholeness. It's sort of the Buddhist equivalent of self-esteem or self-confidence. We feel good about the heart, but not in a personal way it's like, but we trust it. This good feeling of being present, it has a certain kind of solidity that feels good. And then the other recognizable quality is we're really sensitive. And uh, we even have jokes, you know, in the sort of Buddhist scene of how triggering we, uh, how much we can get triggered by silly little things because we're so sensitive. Everything has to be just right. And that's really good for learning, not easy to live with that sensitivity. And it's not always so easy to be living with somebody who's that sensitive either, <laughs> right? You just ask when my wife, and I think it goes both ways. When's a very sensitive human being and I'm a very sensitive human being and it's hard to live with me. And it's probably hard for other people to live with me because I notice everything and I feel everything, right? And so it's easy for that to slip into criticism. It's easy for that to slip into some attitude, get me the hell out of here. I'm done with life, right? So there's this kind of nihilism that can creep into Buddhist practice, like this world sucks. I can't get comfortable. Even if I can get comfortable, I know people are suffering over there. It's like we're right in, in Wisconsin, we're right at the beginning of deer hunting season and being in the country, we've been hearing 
lots and lots of, of course, rifle shots, knowing that deer are getting killed. And, you know, it's, this is just a metaphor for all of the um, suffering in the world. Just one more layer of what's true here and now, everywhere. All the injustice, all the reverberations of injustice, all the wounds that beget more wounds, unhealed wounds that beget more wounds, right? This is a world. So we think when we're really sensitive, I got to get out of here. And that's that cult of perfection. Like I'm here, but I need to get to heaven where I won't be afflicted by this. But needing heaven is its own kind of hell. Needing to get out of here is its own hell realm. So with enough instruction from the Buddha, our wise ancestors, and enough good fortune where we have enough support to stabilize present moment awareness and the right instructions to learn to hang out with that sensitivity and rely on the good feeling of samadhi, of seclusion, having enough of that good feeling of samadhi to tolerate the exposure to what's coming and going. And when we can handle it and we start to act out and plant seeds of suffering, then we emphasize, what can I do to settle my heart? What can I do to touch in to wholesome, a wholesome state of stability? And we might actually need a sense pleasure. I'm gonna have a cup of tea. I'm gonna take a warm bath. I'm gonna go talk with a good friend, right? Or it might be that we, in a more meditative way, we just tune in to the unification of the mind. Like maybe you felt that with the loving kindness practice we did earlier this morning. And with that, <clears throat> excuse me, relatively stable keeping in mind of that generosity of heart the whole mind the whole heart was somewhat unified knowing <clears throat> that attitude of loving kindness and that felt good so we could take up that particular theme of kindness or come back to the breath and feel that just being there with the breath one breath not even a whole breath, just one inhalation, one exhalation, and letting everything fall away because the mind is just knowing that one thing. So this is where using and training the mind to use a meditation object can bring some resilience with the exposure the heart has because it's become so sensitive. So there's this stance between opening letting the heart be exposed to what's coming and going and realizing the heart that isn't dependent on anything. <clears throat> That's the freedom the Buddha teaches. The heart, like I mentioned that phrase, and I thank you to the person who wrote it down in the chat. So Ajahn Chah's teaching his translation of the word nirvana or nibbana. That's the Pali equivalent of nirvana the heart that is free of non-grasping. And it's a little like a koan. Is my heart grasping? Is my heart attached, identified with anything now? Because we can get attached to anything, like even wanting to understand what Ajahn Chah meant, that's a constriction. But we drop it in, the heart free of grasping, we let that momentary, those words and the meaning those words construct for us, we let it have its effect on the mind. We let it dissolve and we just see any lingering effect. That's how we bring up teachings for ourselves. We don't expect, we don't use a teaching as a kind of club to beat down the defilements, the bad habits of mind, you know? Heart free of grasping, <laughs> heart free of grasping. I mean, we do do that sometimes. You know, we, I remember one of my earlier 
loving kindness retreats where I was just doing compassion and loving kindness practice for I don't know, nine days or so. Um, and just using the metta phrases, the loving kindness phrases as a way to sort of push out of my mind anything else. And sometimes the mind really needs forceful medicine like that, but we don't want to get in the habit. We use that forceful medicine when it's needed. And then when it isn't, we have a lighter touch. So really play this week, really play with that teaching. And I'll pick this up one more week in this series of talks next Sunday um, before I go on retreat for a couple of weeks. I'll pick this back up, but really work with that phrase, realizing, waking up, experiencing the heart that isn't grasping, that isn't sticky in any way, isn't holding, isn't dependent on anything. Don't try to figure it out. Just drop that phrase in, momentarily connect with the meaning, and then just be with your experience. Whatever's coming and going, this is being known, this is being felt, almost like this continuity of present moment awareness is a free fall. And just be there. And then when you need to stabilize, you can repeat that phrase. Okay, the heart free from grasping. And change it up. Use non-attachment, the heart that is fully released, the heart that's not dependent, the heart that's not identifying with anything, not in need of holding, like a free fall. So there's lots of different words you can drop into the mind stream and then just abide with what's coming and going, basic mindfulness practice, and bring it up. And then if it gets ever overwhelming and fear comes up and you feel destabilized, then use a meditation object like love, like your breath, like whole body awareness, and really unify the mind with something trustworthy and ordinary or beautiful like love. And just be aware of that for a while until you have that inner good feeling that solidity of being in the moment and that good feeling before really allowing the mind to open up to everything that's coming and going and really using wisdom. And this is how we wake up to the, this is the awakening path, the heart free of grasping, which is always here and now. It's never somewhere else. Any moment can be the moment of the heart free of grasping. Because anything that we're grasping right now, that is only going to be a momentary thing. So if I'm really clinging to the idea that I hope you get what I'm talking about, if I'm really clinging to that idea, I don't have to be afraid of that clinging because its nature is to dissolve. Nothing lasts. This is the thing that's always been true. Think about how many fits we've been in, caught up in anger, caught up in greed, caught up in any number of things. Where is all that now? It's all ceased. So whatever billions of fixated states we've been in in our lives, they've all naturally dissolved without any of you dissolving them. <laughs> those fixated states, those heavy states, those contracted states, they arose because the conditions, supporting conditions were there, and then they dissolved. So I need to leave it here. It's been really nice being with everybody this morning. I'm going to find Shannon. I think Shannon is here to run the yep, small here. groups this morning. Are you here, Shannon? I'm here, yep. Okay, keep talking so I see you, so I can make you co uh, make you host. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, we're going to have the um, normal uh, small groups. So if you are interested, please stay and then we'll talk about um, your how your practice is going, um, maybe specifically with that um, Ajahn Chah quote in mind that um, Mark was talking about in terms of um, the, the free heart, the free mind and grasping and what that looks like in your own practice. And maybe I'll just mention there is a day long retreat this Saturday. And then Gabe and Shelley will start the um, twice annual community practice intensive. I think it might start Monday night, but it's starting soon. Maybe it's a week from this Monday or two weeks from this Monday. And then the year end 
at the annual year-end retreat, that registration will be sent out via the weekly email this week. So you can look for that. Thank you so much, Shannon. And for those staying, have a nice small group discussion. Really nice to be with everybody today. Wishing you safety out there. Please stay on if you'd like to join the small groups now.